photographer and director Patrick Hollick has photographed some of the world's most famous and influential celebrities and artists of our time, including Clint Eastwood, Winona Ryder, Radiohead, Pamela Anderson, Viggo Mortensen, Paris Hilton, Mickey Rooney, Sean P. Diddy Coombs, and the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. Recently, Patrick directed the film Mercy. Uh, Mercy is written and also stars Scott Kahn, along with his father, James Kahn, Wendy Glenn, Troy Garrity, Dylan McDermott, Erica Christensen, John Boyd, and more. You know, Mercy is a story of a, a bad boy writer, played by Scott Kahn, who creates books on love, but has really never experienced a true relationship with a woman other than one night stands and brief hookups. Thank you again, Patrick, for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you in studio. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, we're, you know, we're very excited to very have excited. you here in the studio, Patrick. Yeah. Um, to see more on Patrick's work, please visit Patrick. Holick.com, and that, that's spelled H-O-E-L-C-K. Okay, so let's find out about your beginnings. Where did you grow up, and how did you begin your love with film? Um, I grew up in uh, Canoga Park, California, as a little kid, and uh, I I don't know, I think film was just, uh, I had a video camera, and I used to always make little films with it, and uh, my love for it just came from watching it, uh, you know, it was... Uh, I guess it was just something to do when you're in the San Fernando Valley. There wasn't right. a lot going on. <laughs> so we used to make uh, films with all my friends as, as an outlet and something to do and keep uh, something interesting going on, you know. Mm -hmm. And did you have a support system that encouraged your creativity? Um, not necessarily. I don't think there was a lot of people that were, you know, most of, mostly it was like athletes and in uh, the beginning of like... Uh, rap and stuff like yeah. that so it wasn't really a, a support it was definitely not like it is today but i did have a video camera that was around and uh and it was i was able to do anything with it you know you mentioned in a video interview that i saw of you on youtube that you know you started shooting music videos when you were a teen i believe yeah i was very young i uh i moved to new york city when i was around 16 years old and i wow. had met uh a uh, gentleman uh, named Kevin Bray, who was directing music videos and working as a uh, bartender at this place called Indochine. And he uh, put me right on into uh, art direction. And uh, the first thing I, I worked on was uh, a Gangstar video. Uh, sadly, Guru <laughs> just passed away this yeah. last couple mm -hmm. weeks. Uh, yeah. That was my very first job in, um, in, in rap. And um, that led to uh, directing music videos pretty quickly because... Uh, the the music was exploding in New York then, and, and Kevin became a bigger director, and I became his assistant director, and slowly but surely, I was able to direct. When Kevin went from $20,000 jobs to $100,000 jobs, I was able to come in and start at about 15000 as a director, and then carry it up, just like everyone else had. Wow. So it was pretty fast. I think I got to direct my first video before my 17th birthday, which was like a miracle. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Unbelievable. It's amazing. Wow. And then you say in the the video interview that your life kind of took a different turn, and unfortunately, drugs came into the picture. Yeah, I wouldn't say too unfortunately. It was, and it wasn't immediate. It was uh, years and years of uh, of uh, kind of living the dream. It, I think it was because I was so early, and I was this kid from Los Angeles, and especially being from the San Fernando Valley. What I quickly learned in New York City was is to stop living in in such a narrow view. I immediately met another guy named Vincent Gallo who introduced me to a lot of huge painters. And my perception was getting so twisted from time to time. I would spend some of the days with, with this music explosion, some of the days with some of the most prolific painters that ever lived. And then another part of my, my life was watching restauranteur, this guy Brian and Keith McNally, kind of run this, this other uh, social circle in, Los, in, in New York City. So I, I stopped being a kid that knew everything and started being a listener. And I think that's too, too when I said, you know what, I've always been a Puritan. Uh, I never drank, I never smoked weed, I never did anything. And I started slowly. It wasn't all of a sudden I was a drug addict. It, it was like a progression from weed to what became street heroin. And it was mm -hmm. subtle and it just got faster and faster and faster. Mm -hmm. And I just think it was my desire to try everything instead of be this kid that had this, I, you know, when I first got to New York City, I was very opinionated and very, like, a talker, and, and, and 
by listening, I stopped doing that and I started experimenting. I think it's when I was just like kind of expanding my own horizon and figuring things out. So I, I, sh- I don't think of it as, as an immediate thing and I don't see it so much as a negative thing at the mm. time, you mm-hmm. know. But it did, of course, go all the way over a course of over 10 years to another place, for sure. So it was just part of your journey. It was, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And what kind of turned things around for you? I mean, what kind of re-sparked your interest in life? Because if you're at that point, a lot mm-hmm. of it, you just kind of feel dead inside. So what? Um, what it became, turning? the first thing it does is it gives you so much creative freedom. I was writing more screenplays. I was doing more action. And then it slowly... Uh, ironic because what it gives you it starts taking and it takes a lot more it starts evaporating soul and passion and you start started from writing maybe I wrote a novel when I was like 19 and I was doing a lot of drugs and it, I wrote it like the wind and then you know slowly but surely as the years go on you're writing the 25 times on a piece of paper mm-hmm. and then I would start writing the in paragraph form so it looked like appeared like a paragraph but I had nothing and um, the message started really subtle that you can't live creatively and be a drug addict. So, of course, what I did then was is I started a screenplay about five guys that moved to New York City that all had um, their issues because we all kind of all the boys that worked creatively like came from different parts of the world. And it was a story I wrote about how we all met in New York. But anyway, long story short was uh, I, I had a character that had a lot of problems with drugs, of course, so I was doing research for that final act of, of, of addiction. But it just became really clear, you can't have A and B. And that was the message that just kept getting back in my head. So eventually I surrendered and I decided I, I need to get clean to live in my dreams because right now I'm homeless and I'm sleeping in a park or on rooftops. And I've lost everything I've ever had. Mm-hmm. I've lost, uh, you know, I went all the way mm-hmm. to uh, a whole missing section wow. where I was, you know, a homeless street kid. And that was clear, you know, it finally became clear, like, you're not, you know, doing this and, you know, you have to get your shit together. So as we mentioned in the beginning, you know, your photo credits are uh, just, I mean, they could take up two hours of this show. How did you start photograph some of these people and how did this come into play it it became um i did really well in video and then i uh then i started the drug thing and then when i got clean when i came out of rehab i went to uh a company called dna which is david naylor and associates and i had this reel from new york city and he said oh you know it's really good but it's dated do you think do you have anything new and i said oh you know i was just coming out of rehab and i actually worked at the rehab for a while so i didn't have anything current so I went off and I started shooting stills of um, of the people I was buying drugs for and from and uh, street gangs. So I kind of went back and documented what was kind of very, very real at the time to me and very current against the advice of a lot of people that were like, you don't want to go back there. And I said, yeah, I do, but I have a camera. I had this like buffer between me and it because everyone thought it would lead to you know a severe relapse to go hang out with that social sector. But um, I went back and I did stills of it. And then I had friends in bands like Cypress Hill and um, different bands. Like, uh, like uh, I went on a, a tour, which was like the old Coachella, which was called Lollapalooza. And I had friends who were road managers. So I started documenting bands and street gangs and crowds because those were the three things around me. And I shot them on Tri-X with a Canon AE-1, a 35 millimeter. And I compiled a large piece and edited it to like a dub reggae song and brought it to DNA. And I said, here's something current that I did for five months. And I was able to get a Beanie Man video off of this montage of still images. Mm -hmm. So it was just a tool to get back to music video. As I went through music video, I had this epiphany that I was on set on a video and I I was listening to Led Zeppelin and I was doing a hip hop song. So I thought there was something wrong there. I was blasting Zeppelin and I'm doing this like this really big commercial hip hop song. And I thought to myself, I think we were in Florida or New York. I thought when I go back to LA, I'm going to bring what I know about lighting into the feel of what I'm doing kind of documentary photography. And I'm going to give this a shot and I'm going to get back on the path to making a movie. So I was going to do a fade out of music video and a push into stills. 
and um, also develop film at the time. So that was the plan. And um, photo, I always say, is a pleasant accident because it was. And people always kind of go, oh, you're a photographer. And, you know, I met photography 11 years ago. It's the newest thing that I did. And um, I found it to be a less forceful journey and a more creative outlet because at the time music videos got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and at the height it was very influenced by management and product placement and it it wasn't the same game we used to be able to write something insane on a piece of paper and go direct it but that wasn't the case in video at this point it was more about where the ipod goes and what car we're featuring and it just became unrecognizable work so I I went off to still and I found that ability to be able to uh, shoot stills as I saw them and um, and be creative and at the same time there was a lot it became more lucrative when video fell stills didn't and I was then my objective was to save enough money to make my own film through still photography you know we're we're gonna continue on this path Mm -hmm. Um, I I, I like to just interject for a moment because you know I'm finding it very valuable to, to kind of dive in and, and, and just discover the work ethic of those that we have on our show. Um, you know, how many hours do you put in every day, Patrick? And, and, and where are you spending most of your time these days? Um, my day breakdown? <laughs> a little bit. I, my yeah. days are uh, pretty weird. I have my own company, so I, I start really early. I start about 7.30 in the morning, and I finish probably about 8.30 or 9 at night. Um, uh, the one thing I've got with being clean, I'm almost like 16 years in June sober, is I'm actually really excited to wake up in the morning and start it off. Uh, I start the day uh, in basically, uh, you know, like everybody else, probably returning emails and phone calls. And then I get into like, I, I keep a really tight sheet of paper about uh, objectives and things that I want to do and like films I want to develop. And then I I kind of divide my day into photography, film, and and writing as best as I can. And um, I kind of create wild card days where I catch up on on things that I miss, say, Monday for Wednesday. And, you know, that's pretty much how I kind of do it from... But, uh, yeah, just don't stop. (laughs) Um, I I could just say that uh, the way I've always shot was what I got from learning and beginning with Street Gangs and such was to... To not interject and just do straight point of view, to let the person be the person and not uh, change or, you know, I was coming off of, of what I was saying with like marketing and all this stuff. So, so the neat thing was is to try, try to find, let the person be who they are, not an image or a misrepresentation of the person. <laughs> Basically, that's what I brought to set is like I always brought no ego and just like let the person kind of uh, and notice things if they communicated with their hands, we would nuance the hands with light or the, if they were a person with their eyes just to kind of put punctuation into the person and who they truly are or who I felt they were truly and try to stay out of try to stay out of what I I don't know out of the way as much as possible and capture them on that given day without any you know force right you know, and what makes um, a person easy to shoot and on the flip side what makes them difficult to shoot um I guess people, uh, when you get to uh, shoot some of these entertainers, like when you think of someone like, say, Ian McKellen comes to mind, what makes him easy to shoot is that he can uh, access an emotion or a feeling um, in seconds. So you could, say, uh, be a 22-year-old handsome kid in London. He could close his eyes and open them up, and that kid's there, even though he's a 60-something-year-old man. Mm. Uh, be a horrible nightmare, you know, like the scariest guy in the world, and he can access it. So that's pretty easy, especially when you work <laughs> with actors like that on that caliber, you know. Mm. Um, some people, <clears throat> um, I remember a case where it wasn't so easy with uh, the great, uh, um, uh, what's his name, yeah. um, really wanted to have uh, an objective, a purpose, and a reason for every every photograph, every moment, every hand gesture. So. He wouldn't do anything if it was uh, staged or artificial. Mm-hmm. You know, he wanted to go into a deeper read of what that was. And, and that on that given day, it was just a really good old friend of his sitting off a camera and having a conversation with him. But um, I've been lucky to have subjects that are um, are interesting and, and are, um, they have something, you know. Even in just the, the common... The common people are very interesting, too. <clears throat> I even like people that don't want to be photographed because there's something in that, too. I, I find that fun. I remember, I think, back in the 80s when I was a kid reading an article that um, Paulina Poroskova, the, the supermodel, 
wrote and she said you know I don't really look like that I just know how to pose my body and and pictures to kind of give myself that persona I mean you're dealing with people that are public figures do you ever encounter and you don't have to name names of course but people that there is an insecurity and and you kind of have to bring out a confidence in them and how do you yeah that? that's happened um, mm -hmm. it's very infrequent really it's, um, yeah because our time together sometimes in, in that stage is very brief I see um, so everyone's kind of there to do what they're there to do but um, I haven't had much of it I've been lucky I think it's like I always kind of think of it as like a I'm a janitor approach where I have like this is how I show up and I'm not uh, another presence I've I've had photographer friends of mine that are like equal tier to the celebrity and there's a different <laughs> dynamic me I feel like a worker and I'm there to to capture this thing and I feel like it creates mm -hmm. um, a safe place to play we don't play that we just kind of create this thing have a really nice conversation and they arrive and, and we kind of it's like playing a game of pool together and I, I just think that I don't know if it was I, I purposely tried to do this style it just sort of became a, a place that they felt safe in to to be captured and that's why sometimes we get a little a glimpse of something I see in the eyes like a little more soul than I've seen say in their junket of images all of a sudden I feel like wow we had like a miracle and I felt like I saw it happen where they kind of weren't playing um, the audience perception or some film and in between these shots all of a sudden they arrived and I got lucky and I shot it You know, you, you have photographed some of the top celebrities in the world, uh, from Tom Cruise, Clint Eastwood, you know, Beyonce Knowles, P. Diddy, Will Ferrell, Kanye West, Keith. I mean, it just it just goes on and on. Um, it really becomes a question of who haven't you photographed? Who 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 would you like to photograph that you haven't had the opportunity to yet? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I haven't really thought about it. Uh, I remember I always wanted to shoot, uh, for some reason I always wanted to shoot Ronald Reagan. He passed away. I wanted to shoot Manson for some reason. I always had this thing. I want to shoot this crazy guy. Um, there's so many people. Uh, I don't know. I don't have the names. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of people I'd like to shoot. I was supposed to shoot Obama a few times in it, and we didn't time out uh, to do mm -hmm. it. I was supposed to do him when he won the presidency for Time Magazine, and I, I was runner-up. <laughs> and I mm. didn't get that shoot. That would have been a fun shoot. Wow. Um, I'd like to wow. go back yeah. into um, probably shooting people like Bill, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and, and meet some people like Jamie Dimon and some interesting figures. I just started shooting more athletes, which is fun. Awesome. I just shot a pitcher that was throwing like 110 mile an hour fastball six inches from the lens. And that was exciting. It made it new to me. Wow. Um, but I'd like to shoot some more, um, more people like, um, say, um, people like, uh, D Jamie Diamond and um, and Gates and these guys and right. kind of you know because you get these times where you get to kind of meet a person in a in a pretty nice way through this this work. You know, so for those of you listening right now, um, let's let's get those tweets out. Let, let, let's put that out into the universe yeah. and let's make that happen for Patrick here. Yeah, can we um, send Steve down, <laughs> Steve Jobs, yeah. in a few minutes? Yeah. Uh, you know, we we have a lot of listeners who are aspiring actors, filmmakers, artists, etc. Um, wh what have you gained from working with the best of the best on, on this intimate level that you have? Um, you know, what what have, what have you learned that you can pass on to us? I guess a degree of prof professionalism and um, you know, courtesy and. You never stop learning from great people like, uh, say, Eastwood, and these people are just really class acts and and um, are full of respect, full of love, uh, a lack of ego. Uh, you know, it's just something to always strive for. I, I guess when you meet some of the best of the best, uh, they're just really professional and hard workers and great people. Like I remember people like Beyonce for being <clears throat> super professional, super kind, super helpful in the process. And, mm -hmm. you know, she would come outside where I was smoking in the corner of the Polaroid and, and look at the light with me. She's very, uh, the bigger, the bigger, the more um, together and like everyone's kind of making a good project, trying to make a good end result. And I really admire that opposed, as opposed to some people that are just like disconnected. They don't arrive knowing uh, my work and I don't know, you know, it's just, it just makes it a better day mm -hmm. when everyone's kind of trying to make something as opposed to just being in a routine. And the bigger ones have always showed me 
that they're there like you know the like someone like Cruz would say I saw your website last night I liked this I thought about this and you're just so surprised that they did mm -hmm. research as opposed to some maybe junior actor that's coming out on NBC that doesn't know what day it is who you are why he's there or or, sh or she's there um mm -hmm. I guess you know I I lean towards the other side where you know you're there to work and make something nice mm -hmm. Yeah, that was actually our next question was about Tom Cruise. <laughs> uh, so that's amazing. And we're curious, with someone you know, on that caliber, what are the discussions like? And, and also, once someone like that's in the studio, w how much is he bringing to the table and how much of it is your own creative process? With Tom, it was interesting. Um, I was shooting Katie, Katie Holmes, and he uh, surprisingly visited the studio when they were newly dating. And uh, I... Uh, have a mutual friend named Paul Anderson who made a film called Magnolia with him. Mm -hmm. So he had a little bit of a brief encounter before. And he um, he didn't really bring anything. He just wanted to do a photograph of them for their house, of them, um, you know, together in a portrait. So that was just kind of a, a an added uh, added feature of the day. Um, he, he, you know, Tom, if anyone probably met, he's super energetic and um, he's super professional and, and very nice and... Uh, he pays so much attention, it's it's actually kind of wild. Like, I remember at one point I gave him the camera to shoot Katie when we were lit and set up, and how much he was excited by it. Mm. He's, he's amazing. He's really cool. Tom's the kind of guy that, uh, and my friend worked with him on the film, he comes early, he leaves late, he learns everyone's name. Some people say he's a strange guy, and you saw that in the media, mm. where it kind of got really heightened, and how the guy jumped on a couch, he's a weirdo. Um, but I think he's just, uh, I think there's no accident that he's worked with probably 30 of the best directors. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at his resume, it's crazy how many directors this kid has already worked with. Wow. I think more than anyone I've seen, if you read his mm -hmm. IMDb, he's gone mm -hmm. across the chart with everyone wants, like even Kubrick. It's kind of weird. I think it's a professional, uh, you know, when you're deciding to make a feature like that, I'm sure you're like, who, do we want some defiant person that's going to be found in bars <laughs> or Tom mm -hmm. who's going to be here and know the PA's mother's maiden name Wow! but it, he's oh. very aware mm -hmm. and Katie was sweet and uh, very experimental she was trying stuff and having I think a lot more fun and just letting it go and it was a good day so with someone at that level um, how many people are you dealing with as far as their kind of entourage <laughs> that's always different <laughs> that's interesting you know uh, sometimes it's huge I find that the smaller entertainer brings a lot and the bigger sometimes comes alone in a rent a car interesting yeah wow. and, and is ready like uh, Eastwood rolled in alone and he's very very simple and um you know, it's kind of funny. You see this extraneous uh, entourage with some of these guys, and then the older ones are kind of like, "Oh, we don't. We know we don't need that." And I know I look good in this shirt, and not that one. I don't really need anyone to co-sign my outfit today. And that was my next question again. Yeah, who just said you're good? Wow. <laughs> you just find that thing like someone like that. They've arrived into this thing, and they kind of know um, what they're doing and what they're doing it for, and. Mm. Um, it's an interesting dynamic, but some roll deep, you know, mm -hmm. some roll uh, very shallow. Interesting. <laughs> I never know, you know, it's just fun to watch sometimes. <laughs> it's always an interesting place to be on the other side of the camera because I've seen them come in really big and furious and I've seen those some of those go right out the door and can't get a job. It's a very interesting dynamic to be able to watch it from our side. And uh, how long does it take for you to set up your lighting? Um, and, and how long will you spend shooting someone like Kanye West? I mean, I mean, these are busy it, people. Yeah, it depends. Is it, is it like two hours in the route, or like it how, depends how on the budget and the uh, the the amount of pages and the cover or not. But um, in in the old economy, sometimes we were able to get three or four hot sets, which means uh, before an entertainer gets there, you put an X on the ground and you make it perfect, and they walk A, B, C, D, and they leave. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, um, say like two or three hot sets, um, you would get off, and um, I'd say uh, I have a great team I've been working with for about eight years, and uh, they're up with uh, lighting setups in uh, probably 35 minutes. Um, if it's super, super precious and and delicate, uh, they could spend as much as an hour and 10 minutes on one if the time's permitted. Normally, we get there before the subject, make it all perfect, make it like a walkthrough.
Mm-hmm. And then sometimes you find it exciting that the entertainer moves so fast through it. They're like, let's do some more. I'm having fun, nice. which is like, you know, mm-hmm. and sometimes they really have to go. And sometimes, you know, the, uh, the uh, publicist will say, oh, they got to go to this place. And they'll go, I do, no, I don't. <laughs> I want to stay and shoot. And they're like, we have a flight. And they're like, no, I don't. Mm. <laughs> it's a very interesting dynamic. Interesting. <laughs> you know, and, and, and when, when do you know you have the photograph? When you know, like, you know, okay, this, this is the one I was looking for? Um, I guess it's just a feeling. Um, and, uh, well, digital now, you got these big monitors behind you, so you see things faster. Mm. Um, used to be more of a curiosity before. Now there's like, you know, I have a monitor where I could click through in a few seconds and see, see certain details of it. Um, but, uh, it's a feeling. It sounds weird, but it's a feeling that you got it or not. You know, we have a question coming in from Mr. Wendell Films. Hello. And, and his question is, um, you know, working so close with these huge figures, you know, ha- has it changed your perception of them? That's a great question. I I don't know. I see people as people. It, that to me, it doesn't matter if they won an Academy Award or if they do a real trade uh, and work in construction. I think people are great. Or they're not great people. I don't think it's uh, any difference of it, it, what their day job is, you know, so to speak. It's, um, I guess, uh, yeah, no. You are listening to Film Courage. We are speaking with director Patrick Hollick, whose film Mercy features Scott Kahn, Wendy Glenn, Troy Garrity, and James Kahn. So Scott Kahn, you've known for what, 10, 10 years? Maybe more. Maybe more, like uh-huh. 12 to 13. Yeah. Okay. And had he been kind of on you to to look at some of what he's written or yeah we've them? i've read and seen his plays and uh seen his films and scott's been uh really campaigning he knew that i grew up with some some serious filmmakers and that i was kind of disenchanted with a couple projects that i put together that fell apart due to cast or budget okay. i've been trying to put a film together since i was probably 15 mm. and uh i've had weird courses where it's like the music video became you know coming in fast and I and I survived it and did it and did New York City and and then addiction and and just growing as a human being interrupted it and then a long course of still photography but I always had these films and I always I went to New York City with a screenplay to make a film and then you know life happened you know life as they say life is something that's happened while you're busy making plans Mm -hmm. um that's what it was but um Scott knew this and Scott knew that, that there was guys that had been production assistants when I was a music video director that had gone on to to make huge films and make a real impact. So he was always kind of campaigning for me to make a movie, um, which I love him for. He was very much like a, you know, just pushing and pushing and pushing. And um, he gave me mercy. I uh, I read it, and I thought it was the best screenplay he written because I didn't identify to some of the other stuff he had written. I felt this one was really good. And, um, and so it began... <laughs> And so from the point that you actually read the Mercy screenplay, and how long was that till you actually had the first day of shooting? Huh. From the day of reading it to the first day of shooting, it went relatively quick. What happened was is somebody said, hey, we'll put $250,000 up if you direct and star in Mercy to Scott. And um, all he had to do at that point was basically convince them that he, I was the right guy for the job and not he as director. Um, and basically, uh, I'd say the process from reading it to making it was three and a half months. Wow. Because mm-hmm. they were ready to go, but uh, Scott wanted to say, I'm not directing this and, and get that across. So you were able to piece the money together through... There was a lot of interesting things with the money. The money was supposed to be this and supposed to be that, and uh, it ended up coming in the final hours when we were already 20 days into pre-production in an office. Uh, we had someone fall out and mm. someone come back for all of it. Mm. Yeah, and it grew from 250. Wow, okay. like, because you said that you had kind of, like, projects were started and kind of fell apart previously. Did you, did you feel this one was yeah, going to fall apart? Yeah, I mean, as I well? always felt this, like, disenchanted feeling. You know, I was this optimist and this dreamer, and I used to go in and figure it would be these guys are saying what they mean, and, uh, you know, here I am at, you know, as a kid, I was at CAA, and we were putting the dream cast together to this film. I'm like, it's golden. And then just like things happened, and it, I, I became. I remember I became on one of the fiftieth dinners at the Chateau Marmont with my heart broken. I went outside and I said, "You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to make so much fucking money in still photography that I'll finance my own movie. That's it. 
I'm done. And I'm going to collect celebrities' phone numbers and get everyone's cell phone number and call them directly. These are the two plans. And I started that course actually when Mercy came up. I was just over it at that, 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 that moment. I had that epiphany where it's like, if you want to get this done, it's really in your own hands. It's not these mm -hmm. uh, middle, 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 middle men and Absolutely. smoking mirrors and, um, you know, it basically, I stopped living in that reality and I was like, if we're going to make a movie, mm -hmm. I've got to get the capital and the cast and have a good material and go. You know, the film is in some sense almost two films in one because there's the beginning where um, Scott Kahn's character is this kind of proud, uh, cocky, overconfident guy. And then the second part where things change. And, you know, the first part shows, you know, beautiful people and, and good times and interiors of restaurants. And then, and then the second part is different. How did you approach shooting the film, the kind of the before and after, as the viewers will see? Mm -hmm. see um, I guess I wanted to uh, make sure that the, the transition was really um, clear. And, um, and just, I just kept playing it back in my head and, and writing my notes and my subtext and all my kind of stuff for the transitions between the characters and just kept kind of visualizing what he was like then and what he was like there and mm -hmm. and um that's that's really it uh how i did mm -hmm. that and for for you how is filmmaking different than still photography um well performance and and um rolling of sound i guess you're rolling sound you're still getting a performance in a still photograph but uh i guess it's just a continuation of a scene and then you know mo motion um there are similarities and there's sep differences. I don't know to the, the true separation of uh, the two differences. To me, I think it's all creating something, whether it be <laughs> a still photograph or a film. You know, or it just they feel very similar in a sense. I guess the only thing different is that sound is rolling and performance is organically happening, and you're documenting every second of that. Um, you know, you're directing Scott Kahn and his father James Kahn. Um, in this movie, um, they were also in a movie entitled A Boy Called Hate, which was way back in 1995. Um, but I, I don't know if they necessarily had scenes together, you know, and, 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 and Mercy, they, they have some real um, heavy duty scenes together. What, what was it like directing these two, this father son team together in Mercy? Um, did you offer any direction? Um, or was it kind of like more like sitting back and just letting them do their thing? Um, no, I definitely got to have com uh, conversations with both of them. I think in the beginning, uh, they uh, saw the material differently. Um, I remember that James was concerned with the fact that he was such an unlikable father. Um, and uh, Scott had his vision of the scene. So there, it became a time where um, I would have really, really good time on the side with both of them and communicate it. And then we would, we would actually do it. I got lucky enough to... Uh, do a run through at uh, James's house about uh, three weeks before we started primary shooting for Mercy, and to kind of see what was going to happen with it. I know both of them <clears throat> talk about how intense and uncomfortable, and you know James wanted to make sure he did really well because it's Scott's, you know, something Scott wrote, and and vice versa. It was, I think it was really intense for them, um, and it was intense for me, uh, but they were just really great it just really they, they, something happened and, and, and when we started rolling the first take of it I remember that was it just felt right it just felt like oh this is going right and um, I'm really happy that this is this is happening right now I remember seeing like that kind of there was a silence in the room and the camera rolled and, and that scene started and it went really well I think they were both really um, hard on themselves in that you know this that moment wasn't as easy say for them as it was for someone like me that's observing it mm -hmm. you know their family it's his dad and <laughs> it's intense yeah you know i remember reading somewhere that you know they you know scott said that you know they have a totally different relationship in real life so sure. to try to act that out you know and, and be authentic and be honest and be real what yeah. was very challenging for them yes um, james said something to me he said you know what you always want is unpredictability in a performer otherwise you don't have shit and uh He's a very unpredictable and a good way guy. You know? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way to put yeah, it. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, this film has Scott Kahn, it has Wendy Glenn, Troy Garrity, Erica Christensen, um, Dylan McDermott, um, James Kahn. Um, can you tell us about the, the challenges that you face getting Mercy in, you know, its theatrical run? 
Um, well, yeah, well, the first challenge was, we, I think we thought we were going to Sundance really fast and, and like in a bullet, and um, that wasn't the case. They didn't, didn't have any interest in having us at the festival. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, it was just kind of, kind of rethinking um, how it would play, and then just kind of a miracle in the sense that we did okay in this Berlin film market. We got some attention. Then we got to be in Cine Vegas, which is a really good help. And then IFC started started seeing this film and Lizzie Nastro, who's over there, um, and she came and bought it. And it actually was a small world because we had met through a, a really close friend in New York City. It was just all, I don't know, it's so hard to say, you know. You just kind of keep putting it out there mm -hmm. and then energy starts getting around it. And ironically, IFC acquisitioned it over a bunch of the ones that were in our original goal, which was Sundance that didn't get bought. So mm. go figure. You know, I can't figure it out. It's just kind of wild. Um, they were re they they understood the film. Mm -hmm. They were uh, campaigning about the film. They weren't um, just kind of acquisitioning to put something out. They felt like the right fit. They were really they understood the nuances and they understood the movie. And after knowing, I knew that Lizzie had bought some Harmony Corinne films and uh, that I liked, like Mr. Lonely. And I thought she was the right girl for the job. I felt like she was she she understood it, and her team understood it. And they've there's Courtney Ott over there, and and they've all just been really helpful and supportive, of, and not just taking my calls and just blah blah blah. You know, you hear about people buy a film and then you never hear from them, and you know this went wrong, that went wrong. They haven't been like that. They've been checking in and creating a lot of uh, buzz and and push and help, and it's very nice. We have Nathaniel J. Brown. Um, NB set the trends um, writing in a question he, he writes as a model actor musician in Raleigh North Carolina um, what networking tips would you give for someone getting into the industry into which part of the industry that was a lot of them <laughs> <laughs> well he, he says he's a model an actor and a musician so I you know he's giving you a three there uh -huh. um, you know from your from your experience I mean what, what, what could you recommend to, to Nathaniel in terms of really getting his career going mm. I mean uh, I, I mean, guess it's just to create awareness around himself with his, his abilities like you know if he does music to make a video of, you know so people could start to see his dynamic mm -hmm. you know and, and just work really hard I mean it sounds corny but uh, all it is is really um, you know pushing and, and really trying and getting up and, and doing the work you know, because I guess he's concerned that he's he's living in Raleigh, North Carolina, as opposed to New York City. Los With Angeles. the internet and all that stuff, it's like it doesn't really matter. I mean, what's the band that just came out of? Uh, was it Australia? Or the the brother and the sister. What are they called? Hmm, it sure just blew up that. bigger. They played really? Coachella and they did the best at Coachella this year. Everyone was freaking out. They're 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 from like New Zealand and they're doing hip hop. I don't know what it's called. You know. No, I don't know. But that's a but it doesn't really matter. I mean, these guys came over mm -hmm. and they took the U.S. by storm, and um, it just was uh, started on the internet. Absolutely. And we've had that question come up before, where there are some people that are adamant that say you have to be in New York or L.A. That's an interesting anything. dynamic in our new world. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's like uh, if that's so true. Mm -hmm. Is it? I don't know. What do you guys feel? <laughs> I feel with the internet, it's kind of crazy. The new world yeah. of immediate visual gratification and, yeah. and information. Absolutely, yeah. you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer of of the power of the internet, mm -hmm. um, and, and just you know, like you said, you, you know, you want you got to put in the effort, you have to put in the work. Yeah, you put it up and you show it, and you try to get hits, and you spread it to the right blogs, and you know, it either catches or it doesn't, and you make something else, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's interesting. Yeah, it's the, the, more the time you put yeah. in than where I think. But yeah, you know, and, and, and technology is so cheap now, you know, mm -hmm. in, in terms of getting a camera, you know, getting out, um, filming something, shooting something, recording something, you know, if you're a musician, um, to, you know, just take advantage of the resources in front mm -hmm. of you. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, I, I think too many people put, put hurdles in front of themselves. Um, yeah, that's too, important. Too, too many roadblocks. Yeah, you know? that's important to know that it's just, it's really not about all that stuff. I used to say all the time that it's like, you know, like, to get out of your own way and like get therapy for those kind of blocks because I definitely had them as well. It's just there's nothing we can't do. There really isn't. You know, I guess lastly, I, I just want to touch on. Um, you know, you've had some great things happen here with Mercy. Um, you know, all, all the challenges that you faced in previous years getting a project off the ground. Th there really seems to be some sort of magical force um, behind behind Mercy getting made. Um, 
you know, I mean, what was it? Was it Scott Kahn? Was it the fact that that he was just on this and that he got behind it and that he was also going to make it happen? Mm-hmm. What what really brought? I this, think Scott you know? is like uh, one of the best uh, executive producers and and um, um, passionate guys I know, and I really really admire his drive. Scott is, I'm like p- Scott's kind of aggressive and I'm kind of passive and mellow. So the team of us was a good good thing mm-hmm. and i i really uh admire how how aggressive scott is he 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 will not hear no he keeps going down the street whereas sometimes i'll say okay well then you know this and they'll be like no 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 we're going we're going you know so yeah a, a lot of it was his push and his aggression and, okay. and it was uh you know he also inspires me that way too you know mm-hmm. i think we inspire each other for different reasons We've been speaking with Patrick Hollick, his movie Mercy, featuring Scott Kahn, Wendy Glenn, Troy Garrity, Erica Christensen, Dylan McDermott, and James Kahn, is in theaters right now. For more info, please visit ifcfilms.com. And for more info on Patrick's work, please visit patrickhollick.com, and that's H-O-E-L-C-K. So, uh, Patrick, it's been great having you with us in studio. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.